Oh my goodness, you guys, I am being left alone in one of the most precious cars in the world. No pressure at all. Don't f it up. <sighs> okay, I've been trying to compose myself, but this is a very exciting day. This is Porsche number one, considered by Porsche to be the first, the progenitor to the 356. This is where it started, and my God, it's a darling. It's also a very curious vehicle and something of a car of Theseus. There's a lot going on here, and today we are going to drive this precious, precious vehicle. Porsche number one is technically known as 356-001. This vehicle, completed in the spring of 1948, was one of the first projects that Porsche undertook as the company was reborn after its founders emerged from jail for some stuff they'd been up to in the 1940s. Initially conceived as a contract offering from the Porsche engineering firm to be offered to Volkswagen as a sporty alternative to the then fresh VW Beetle, the 356-001 was envisioned as something that could use existing off-the-shelf Volkswagen parts, but create something a little more special. The son of the family dynasty, Ferry Porsche, had been involved in racing projects dating back to his teenage years. Most notably there, the Silver Arrows, and that has had a profound impact on this, because while this first 356 employed that same flat four engine, it put it the wrong way around. This is not your usual 356 that followed. This is a mid-rear setup, and it gets even weirder. You see, to use those off-the-shelf bits, Porsche took the existing transaxle and that engine, but also the existing Beetle rear suspension, and then turned it all backwards. As a result, instead of the usual trailing arm suspension that we see in a lot of cars, even into the more recent classic era, this thing uses leading arms. It's utterly bizarre. And while well, at the time this car was praised for its interesting driving dynamics and apparently sporty handling, that is actually a setup that could make things rather precarious. Going over bumps, that would actually let the wheels tow out in really unpredictable ways. We joke a lot about the precarity of 911 handling and how endearing it is. That is only taken to a higher level here. Now today, we aren't running this precious, priceless classic in quite the same way that we might run something that's a little less sacred, but we're still getting a feel for it. More than that, we're doing it on public roads. With that, let's hit the road. Oh goodness. Oh goodness. So we are actually out on the road driving one of the most precious cars that still exists. Yes, there's a lot that feels rather early Beetle about it, but it's just the knowledge that things are different. So in the back there, we've got that four-cylinder air-cooled flat four. That's connected to a four-speed manual transmission, unsynchronized and straight cut. That is what's giving us that wonderful gear whine out back. Also wonderful out back is that delightful clickety-clackety typewriter air-cooled sound. Better still, however, it's right here behind me because of that mid-engine configuration. It's not way out back like it is in a Beetle or a production 356. Likewise, given that whole VW parts bin thing, a lot of the controls are pretty familiar too. So we're making our way around the coast here in Carmel, and it's just leisurely. This car is so hugely significant. It's a car that competed just a little bit. It's a car that was built by someone who built race cars for someone who wanted an engaging drive. And as a car of this era, it even at this low speed feels just happier than most cars I've driven of this era. This is a car that I could see myself just cruising along in, rather like the 356 Speedster that is just ahead, that I think we're actually just about to pass. Look at this lovely little car. We love a Speedster. So I've got a whole bunch prepared for all of you about this car. I can talk to you about the flat four-cylinder air-cooled engine that's been bored out. Originally, it had bigger heads. It was a higher compression, 1.1 liter, making 35 horsepower, 53 pound-feet of torque. That is not a lot. And compared to the other cars Ferry Porsche had been working on with 450 horsepower V16s, that's nothing. But it's also a tourable road car, and it only weighs 585 kilos. There's not a lot here. 
helping move all that along is a fun little unsynchronized straight cut four speed manual transmission. It's a bit of a funny little setup. This is my favorite sort of vehicle to drive. There's just tactility, even when you're at low speeds or at idle. It just feels in so many ways. This isn't even about the significance of this car now. This is an experience that, by and large, you can get from a 356. And indeed, the production 356 was almost certainly a better car to drive. You see, while it doesn't have that mid-engine novelty, that mid-engine setup made this thing a little bit weird. To be able to use off-the-shelf suspension, transaxle, and so on, Porsche simply inverted the whole thing 180 degrees. And so instead of trailing arms like you would normally have, you have leading arms. The whole suspension out back hinges from the back of the car. That is just absolutely bonkers. It's such a silly concept. But I gotta say, it's pleasant. It's comfortable across this coarse surface. Okay, straight away, just over that bump, however, even at low speed, you can feel how this doesn't unsettle like a normal car that you're used to. This is different. That setup is just plainly unfamiliar. You've got good travel, you've got plenty of sidewall, you've got fabulous style, and you've got good noise, and thanks to the upgraded one and a half liter that's in this car because of its complex life after the fact, you've also got a little bit of power. Now, that 1.5 liter is only part of the story because over the years, this car saw a lot of different iterations and a lot of different forms. Porsche number one here was sold to a private owner the very day it was certified for road use back in 1948 in Austria. After that, the car had a tricky life. At one point, a car full of nuns crashed into the thing. It's been restored several times. It was rebodied briefly in the image of a contemporary 550. Again, like a contemporary speedster. This thing has seen a lot of different shapes. Another change is the braking setup. This car was built with cable actuated brakes. Those were later upgraded to a simple hydraulic system. The one and a half liter that ended up in this car for competition goals just came out of a later 356. As a result, it's rather serviceable now. With that then, it is something of a car of Theseus, but that's part of its honesty and its charm. This car is huge in Porsche's history, and it has a rich and colorful history of its own. It's been a real privilege to be able to touch and experience that. So that's work today. It's certainly not the sporty car that followed. Compared to a 356, this thing feels really, really subdued. It may have that later powertrain, but this thing is still just a gentle runabout at this point. And you know what? That's fine. That's awesome, in fact. What we have here is a delicate vehicle with a bit of a delicate history around it. But we also have it on the road here in the 2020s. As an investment in heritage and faith in the vehicle, that is absolutely phenomenal. For Driving.ca, I'm Al Alden.